All right, uh, I think we can get started now. Um, there are over um, 30 um, attendees. Um, so, hello everyone. Um, welcome to Ask Simna series. Um, I'm Jiang, the Simna coordinator. I will be the moderator together with our um, communication specialist, Ms. Kathy Medney. So today we are excited to have our distinguished speaker, Professor Schneider, joining us from Caltech. Just so you know, then the seminar is being recorded and will be later published on our YouTube channel. Please feel free to ask questions. You can either do it uh, through chat or with the virtual hand, um, and we will unmute you. Um, let me give a first, um, first give a brief introduction about the speaker. So Professor um, Tapio Schneider is the Theodore Wu Professor of Environmental Science and Engineering at Caltech. He's also a senior research scientist in NASA's JPL. With his collaborators, he has shown how rainfall extremes intensify as Earth's warms and how clouds can change with climate and how winds and weather on other planetary bodies uh, like Jupiter and Titan came about. He's currently leading the Climate Modeling Alliance, whose mission is to build the first climate model, then automatically learn from data to produce accurate climate prediction. Okay, so let's welcome our speaker and Professor Schneider, please proceed. Thank you for the introduction and for the opportunity to speak um, to all of you. So I will talk about that project that you just heard about, the Climate Modeling Alliance, and how we are approaching merging science, traditional ways of doing science with data-driven approaches that use data massively. I'll show you some examples of work I've done with a number of collaborators, a number of students and postdocs. The results that you'll see are principally in collaboration with Yayo Cohen, Ana Yaruga, Jahe, Ignacio Lopez Gomez, Emmett Clary, Holly Dunbar, and Alfredo Garbuno. They're all students, postdocs, and the applied math side, a colleague at Caltech is Andrew Stewart, who was instrumental in getting this project started and for some of the results that you were about to see. So the problem we're addressing, I think, is familiar to all of you. Earth is warming, Earth's temperatures have risen over the past 150 years. We've had a little more than one degree centigrade warming since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Here is just an, an image of the spatial distribution of this warming. So it's the low pass filtered version of the temperature change over the past 150 years. You see that warming is global. There are some gray patches in here. The gray patches are just areas where there isn't enough data to say much about the low frequency temperature trend. But everywhere else where you don't have these gray patches, you see Earth has been warming. And the warming has been especially pronounced over continents and in high latitudes for reasons we understand having to do with well, amplification of global warming and having to do with um, lack of avail availability of water and hence stronger over continents than over oceans. It is more or less what we would expect to be happening um, under greenhouse warming, and that's what we are seeing now. It's quite striking how strong the warming has been, for example, in high latitudes, high latitude content. This is an annual mean. You already had more than three degrees warming in some areas. Um, now, what we'd like to know is what will happen in the future as we go forward. And you can ask the question of what will happen in the future in a variety of ways. One, one way is asking at which CO2 concentration will we exceed some temperature threshold, say take the two degree warming threshold of the Paris Agreement. We had a degree already, it's about another degree to go. So if you ask climate models of the CO5 generation, how much more CO2 we can put into the atmosphere before we realize another degree of warming. Um, the answers vary between somewhere around 480 parts per million down here and close to 600 parts per million up here. These are just 29 climate models and their answer to the question of when or at which CO2 concentration will we have realized another degree of warming. Uh, you can translate this into time. So 480 parts per million, we are at 415 right now. 480 we'll reach in the next 20 years or so, irrespective of policy intervention. So if the models on the right here are right, 
then two degrees warming will be exceeded soon and will be inevitable. If the model's further on the left or right, then we have considerably more time. So even under a high emission scenario, close to 600 ppm, you will not reach before the 2060s or so. So this is the uncertainty as indicated by this ensemble of opportunity of models, and it spans a wide range in time. It's a full human generation difference in a prediction between the models here on the right. They're, they're the ones that are more sensitive to climate change. The models here are ordered in order of increasing climate sensitivity, or the models on the left, which are less sensitive, um, give you a full human generation more time before this two degree warming threshold is crossed. And we don't know which, if any of these models is right, or whether even the right answer lies in the range spanned by the models. The principal reason that these predictions are uncertain and the principal reason for the spread among models are that models give different answers to how low clouds respond to climate change. The low clouds that are the main culprit um, behind the uncertainties are low clouds over tropical oceans. So here is, um, I'm sitting somewhere around here, Los Angeles, Baja California, California. There's a stratocumulus deck off the coast, pretty much year round, reflecting sunlight and leading to cooler temperatures underneath. If you go, say, to the Hawaiian Islands, um, around here, you see the strat cover is, is more sparse, it's more cumulus clouds, fewer strata cumulus, more dark ocean is exposed, hence more sunlight is being absorbed, hence it's, it's warmer around there. And fundamentally, we don't know if we get more or less strata cumulus clouds, more or less cumulus clouds as the climate warms. If you get more of these low-lying clouds, then more sunlight will be reflected we would get less warming. If you get fewer of them, that will amplify the warming from greenhouse gases. Uh, you have a positive feedback and amplifying feedback on global warming because more sunlight will be absorbed. And that would amplify whatever warning you get from the CO2, rising CO2 levels alone. And models give widely different answers on, on the magnitude and even the sign of this feedback. So if you go back to this graph I showed you before, the principal difference between the models on the left, that are less sensitive, and the models on the right, that are more sensitive is, the models on the left tend to produce more low clouds as the climate warms, and the ones on the right tend to produce fewer low clouds as the climate warms. Um, most models tend to produce fewer low clouds, and then the, the stronger that feedback is, the stronger the warming, the lower the critical CO2 threshold at which, say, two-degree warming threshold would be exceeded. So we want, we want more accurate climate predictions than we can deliver right now. And the reason is primarily climate adaptation. We will have to adapt to a new climate. There's no question that the climate is changing and will be changing. And the question is how much and with what impacts. And we'd like to be able to make want to quantitative decisions, data-driven decisions, for example, about planning infrastructure, building a seawall in New York City or Miami. How high should it be so that it protects against storm surge 2050? What kind of water management infrastructure do you need, for example, to ensure food and water security in sub-Saharan Africa? The estimated cost of climate change adaptation, this is by now from a report that's five years old, was lying and was expected to reach something like $200 billion annually by 2050. By now, that figure has crept up even higher. It's very clear that climate is changing. It would be very costly to adapt. And if you have more accurate information, you can adapt more effectively. Uh, you can adapt, invest your resources wisely. There are various estimates of what the socioeconomic value would be of more accurate climate predictions. One was that if you reduce the uncertainty in these types of predictions that I showed you before by a factor of two within the next 10 years, um, the socioeconomic value would lie in the trillions of US dollars. So it's clear that we need to do better in providing more accurate information. It's clear there's a demand in the public sector and the private sector. The question is, how can we get there to deliver that? And to answer the question how to, how to get there, let's first talk about why it's difficult to um, get more accurate climate predictions. And there are various ways of looking at it. One, one way that's pretty intuitive, if you just focus on the cost part, which is not the only source of uncertainty, but a main source of uncertainty, is this. So what happens in a cloud is that you have updrafts in which water vapor condenses as the air cools, and as it condenses, it forms cloud droplets. If you ask how much water is in the atmosphere, so if you take all the water in the atmosphere or all the water vapor, which is almost the same question because more, most water is in vapor form, condense it, bring it to the surface as a liquid layer, you get a liquid layer about 25 millimeters thin, so it's about an inch thick. If you take all the condensed water in clouds, 
uh, for example, in a cumulus or stratocumulus cloud, or in a global average, which is about the same answer, take all the condensed water, so all the droplets and ice crystals, bring them to the surface as a liquid layer. Uh, you get a liquid layer about 100 microns thin, so it's the thickness of a human hair. And without knowing a lot about climate models, you can even then can appreciate that um, it's very hard to predict the small residual of water vapor in itself as constituent under the atmosphere. It condenses in updrafts as the air in updrafts cools. So that's one way of looking of, at why clouds are hard to model in a climate model. Another way of looking at it's perhaps a bit more standard is to say a climate model has a resolution right now typically 100 kilometers going towards tens of kilometers routinely. Um, but the dynamical scales of low clouds, especially, are on the orders of tens of meters, even smaller, tens of meters to 100 meters for cumulus clouds, even smaller for stratocumulus cumulus clouds. So there's a large scale gap um, between what the climate model can resolve and what we would need to resolve to resolve clouds accurately. I should say climate models are going towards tens of kilometer resolution, so soon you'll be able to resolve deep convex clouds, at least marginally. But that is still far away from being able to solve, resolve low clouds, which again have scales of meters or so. So this is not going to happen even within decades that we can simulate low clouds globally. So usually these low clouds and other small scale processes are represented in some ad hoc fashion by parameterizations and climate models, which are not data driven. They're not using data in, in any extensive way. And the result is, well, the climate models are good at some things, everything large scale they're good at, but simulating low clouds, they're quite bad at. Here's just one graph from one model, but really all climate models look pretty much the same. It's nothing particular about this model. Um, it shows the bias in low cloud cover. So it's the low cloud cover and percent minus the observed low cloud cover. And what you see in, for example, in these subtropical stratocumulus regions of the coasts, um, of the west, west coast of subtropical continents, you see a large underestimation of cloud cover up to 50% or so color scale here saturates. And that leads to large energy flux biases of order of 50 watts per meter squared, because if you have too few clouds, you reflect too, much, too little sunlight and you have a large bias in the energy flux, which percolates into biases in rainfall patterns and the like. So improving predictions is urgent. That is clear. The predicting clouds is hard. How can we make progress? And the, the central idea here is this. We have a plethora of data. We've never had more data about the Earth system than we have now. Earth's data sphere is growing by a terabyte per day, and that's accelerating. For example, from a constellation of satellites like the uh, A train here, and in addition, we have ocean floats, ground based data, and the like. We have used these data to, to evaluate climate models. We have not used the data extensively to inform climate models in the development process. Some, in a limited way, have been used but we have not tried to use the full potential that these data have at informing models. And the other thing we can do is generate data computationally. <clears throat> Clouds we cannot simulate on the globe, impossible for the foreseeable future, but we can simulate them quite well in limited areas. So here's a large edge simulation, high resolution simulation of cumulus clouds in, in the tropics. Blue is rain, gray is a cloud. The colors at the bottom is buoyancy or effect of the temperature. And these simulations, well, they look pretty good, but more to the point, we can verify them against field data. They are faithful simulations of cloud dynamics. Even in those simulations, you need still need to parameterize cloud microphysics, but at least the dynamics we can simulate quite well in limited areas, not on the globe. So you can do this in one spot on the globe. You can do it in many spot of, spots of the globe. You can embed such simulations in a global model. So you can spin out a high resolution simulation in one grid box, for example, of a global model, or you can do it in thousands of grid boxes. And what this gives you is high resolution data, computationally generated data on clouds. Some parts you still need to parameterize, say microphysics. The dynamics, at least, you can fairly faith faithfully simulate. And what then you can do is use these computationally generated data to inform the global model, basically globalize the data. You can generate this in, in many spots, but not everywhere on the globe. Um, and then you can use that to inform parameterizations that, that globalize the data to the rest of the globe. So the idea here is you can 
learn from observational data and we can learn from computationally generated data that we can generate even on the fly as the model runs at will where we need it when we need it whenever for example some uncertainty metric tells us we, we'd like to have more information about cloud fields in this particular location or at this particular time this lends itself well to distributed computing these these high resolution simulations if you spin out you can run them on the cloud they don't need to communicate much with one another so they lend themselves very well to distributed computing which makes the approach appealing because distributed computing is where large resources are available the idea is to build a model that learns automatically both from observations and from high resolution simulations and um has at its core, if you wish, fairly traditional parentizations, but these parentizations learn from the data sources that we have, Earth observations and data that we can generate. Even in a changed climate, we can generate these data computationally for clouds or ocean turbulence or sea ice and the like. Um, what we're doing is, uh, it doesn't have an established name. I don't quite know what to call it yet. Uh, you could call it process informed machine learning or Scientific machine learning is a term that's sometimes being used. Sometimes people call it physics informed machine learning, but you can do the same thing with all the biological systems, chemical systems. So it doesn't need to be physics informed. Um, the idea is to combine the best of both worlds of reductionist science as we have practiced it for centuries with new data science tools that have become available. If you think about the success of deep learning, it rests primarily on over parameterization, meaning you estimate many parameters to get very good interpolators, approximations to the data set. The methods become very data hungry as a result. And they, it leads to challenges in generalization. It leads to challenges in interpretability and uncertainty quantification becomes hard. And the key here is you want to predict the climate we haven't seen. And if you overfit the present climate, it raises questions about how well you'll do in predicting a climate that you haven't trained your machine learning tools with. So deep learning alone, our view is, is unlikely to be successful. In an option, the success of reductionist science as we have practiced it since the 17th century, since Bacon's time is first parameterizations. Newton's celestial mechanics was successful because it was a fairly sparse parameterization of celestial motion and of how apples fall off a tree relative to models that have been around before. It makes it generalizable, it makes it interpretable. And we want to build on that success model. So what we want to do is use the reduction of science as we have practiced it, but combine it with some form of machine learning that puts machine learning where reduction of science reaches its limits. So all of these ideas was born as Climate Modeling Alliance, started two, year, two years ago. We are now about 60 or scientists, engineers, applied mathematicians at four institutions at Caltech, where I am, at MIT, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and Naval Postgraduate School, and there are some at other institutions as well, New Jersey Institute of Technology. And together, we are trying to translate this vision into a reality of a climate model. So what we are building is, at its core, a fairly traditional Earth system model that have components that you would all recognize as Earth system model components for atmosphere, ocean, land, and the like. And wrapped around it is a layer of data simulation machine learning tools that allows these components eventually to learn directly from all data that are available, observational data from space, from the ground, or data generated computationally in high resolution simulations for clouds or sea ice or ocean turbulence that you spin out when you need them, where you need them. So, how does it actually work? Let me just try to give you an example to illustrate the points. Um, the, key, the key for climate as opposed to weather is that we need out of sample predictability. And again, that's this generalization issue. We need to predict the climate we haven't seen, yet we want to use present day observations as much as we can. So what we are doing is using known equations of motion to the extent we can to minimize the number of adjustable parameters and avoid overfitting. Um, now, climate data often do not have high temporal resolution, but they do provide inform informative time aggregate statistics. So if you think about cloud cover again, uh, polar orbiting satellites don't provide high temporal resolution. You just go over the same spot on Earth's surface every 10 days or so. But once you aggregate the ten the data and time, you get good statistics of time average cloud cover. So 
we want to learn from those climate statistics, A, because they're easily available, and B, because this is what actually matters for climate. You want to predict statistics of the system, not necessarily you know, cloud cover over Pasadena, California, 20 years from now, that's not possible to predict, but make, make statements about average cloud cover, for example, in various parts of the world. So what we want to do is learn from climate statistics, which is different from learning from weather states and, and data simulation and numerical weather prediction. And that has various advantages that I'll explain in a minute, um, but it raises an immediate challenge. If you want to learn from climate statistics, you need to generate the statistics, or at least the season, the seasonal cycle is a great um, climate statistic that you can use to inform a model with. But now if you want to learn from the seasonal cycle, you want to calibrate a model with a seasonal cycle, you need to generate seasonal statistics many times. So you need to run a model thousands of times over a seasonal time scale and longer. And that becomes computationally extremely expensive. So what we need are fast algorithms for learning about models from data and how to get those, I will explain after I explain a bit about the first part, how we use reductionist signs. Um, so that, let me just first talk a bit about the work of Yair, Ja, Anna, Ignacio, and, and several others on how to <clears throat> use known equations of motion as far as you can until you can't go further to get reduced order models for, in this case, turbulent clouds, convection, turbulence clouds and convection. And in a way, this is a success story of how far you can go with fairly traditional science before you even use any data simulation machine learning tools. The problem in existing models is this, or the problem is this. If you look at just about any climate model, it will have parameterizations for deep convection, for shallow convection, and for boundary layer turbulence, plus other parameterizations coupled to it for microphysics, and often the microphysics can be different for deep convection and for other clouds and the like. So to represent clouds, convection, turbulence in a model, you have at least typically five different parameterization schemes, sometimes more, that interact in some way or with discontinuous switches between one and another. Convection schemes often are mass flux schemes, um, turbulence schemes often are diffusive schemes, and diffusive closures and mass flux closures don't play too well with one another. They're discontinuous limits going from one to another, and hence you have discontinuous uh, transitions from one scheme to another in parameter space, even though the physics involved um, varies continuously across across parameter space, for example. So one example you can think about is if you take the dry limit of a climate model, you should, all these schemes should re reduce to schemes for dry wall-bounded turbulence, but they all have different limits and as you take the dry limit, as you take the data vaporization to zero and lead to compensating tendencies, for example, and problems and um, how they interact with one another. It also leads to the proliferation of parameters, each one of these schemes has different parameters, and um, these parameters often are not easily separable from one another. You have interactions between these schemes. If you just look at data, the parameters are correlated, and it becomes hard to identify the parameters from data. So what we wanted to do is, first of all, unify the schemes, and we are building on work from a number of people started at ECMWF a long while ago, Pierre Shibisma, Jal uh, Teixeira, various others proposed this prioritization called EDMF, Eddy Diffusivity Mass Flux Schemes, that marries the mass flux and the diffusion approaches. And we're building on that approach. So we took, we took their ideas um, and extended them by taking the equations of motion, the Stokes equations, and coarse graining them in much the same way that Shibisma, Teixeira, and others have showed us how to do. You take the equations and you average the equations over subdomains. There's a distinguished subdomain called the environment that has sort of fairly isotropic turbulence. And then there are n other subdomains that represent coherent structures, updrafts, downdrafts, and the like. Now I'll show you some examples for just one updraft and the environment, but the decomposition is fairly general. So you can do this for the continuity equation, for any scalar mean equation. You can do it for uh, scalar covariance equations. And if you just average over the subdomains, what happens is that on the right-hand side, you get terms that become closure terms that represent interactions between subdomains. So for example, here's a continuity equation. Um, A is the updraft area fraction or the, the area fraction for the relevant subdomain. So left-hand side is just the continuity of mass for the subdomain. 
On the right hand side, there are terms representing mass exchange through entrainment and detrainment with other subdomains, say plume interacting with its environment, but it could also be plume to plume. The same and for example, any scalar mean equation, say for potential temperature, you still have entrainment, detrainment terms, and then there's a turbulent transport term arising. The turbulent transport term is close diffusively, and that's the, the eddy diffusion part of the closure here, and the entrainment, detrainment type closures, it's, it comes from the mass flux closures. What we do a bit differently from others is that we keep the entire left-hand side, including time-dependent terms, which is important, for example, for once you approach this gray zone of deep convection, um, where you want to have memory on the subgrid scale, so that there's memory in convective plumes, and these are memory terms which we retain. It changes a bit what you mean by parentization, so everything on the left-hand side here for us becomes part of the dynamical core of a model. The parentization are just the closures on the right-hand side. So even say something like an updraft term, this vertical advection term here would be for us become part of a dynamical core. So on the right side is where all the problems lie. Um, you can do this coarse grinding exactly, um, but on the right hand side, you get closure terms that you, you don't know what they are a priori, and those you have to close. As I said, turbulent transport terms, we close diffusively, entrainment, detrainment are some of the key terms that need to be closed. And what we are doing here is, in some ways, what has been done in fluid dynamics since Prandtl's times at early in the 20th century. We let's take entrainment detrainment as an example. We know that the fractional entrainment detrainment rates have units of one over length scale. You can work through what candidate length scales you have from the physical parameters. There are various candidate length scales. One that makes sense is buoyancy divided by vertical velocity squared, so units of one over length. We choose that as our master length scale. And while that in itself doesn't restrict the closure very much, we say there is an undimensional function of all non-dimensional groups in the problem, could be relative humidity, could be ratios of other length scales and the like, that we don't know what it is. And our learning in the end will just focus on that function. We'll just use machine learning ideas to learn this function from data eventually. What I'll show you next is simply educated guesses for this function that are based on what others have done. And uh, I'll show you how well that works. You, you apply similar approaches to pressure gains that are unclosed and eddy diffusion uh, terms. They depend on the turbulent kinetic energy and the mixing length scale for which we use physical arguments um, to constrain it. And let me just show you how well that works just in a way using pure physics, nothing data driven so far, except that there are some coefficients like the C epsilon that we'll have to estimate from data. Here's the same map that I showed you before with the, uh, the cloud bias figure, just to orient yourself where you are. So I'll show you some results in a subtropical stratocumulus region, say off the coast of Baja, California here. Um, this is a region that's often covered in stratocumulus clouds. And here is in black, a large eddy simulation we did. And blue is our parentization. It's just a one dimensional model with, um, I think in this case, 64 degrees of freedom. And gray is the range of other large eddy simulations and orange are just observations. And what you see is that the parentization captures the stratocumulus layer extremely well. I mean, it's, it's almost on top of the parentization. And what's even more interesting, if you go say to an Arctic uh, boundary layer, it's a, for those who know, it's the Gables study site. Um, Arctic boundary layers are hard. They're, they're very stably stratified, turbulence is intermittent. They're even hard to simulate in large any simulations. So solid lines here is um, one velocity component, blue is the other velocity component in a large eddy sim simulation and solid lines. Shading is a range of other simulation, large eddy simulations. And then here is our one dimensional model, single column model at various vertical resolutions. You see at 50 meters vertical resolution, it does reasonably well, but it doesn't capture at all. If the vertical resolution near the boundary is fine enough, it also captures the, uh, the stable boundary layer with the same parameters, the same parameterization as in the stratocumulus case, extremely well. Relatively high vertical resolution, that's a price to pay, but if you have that with um, a one-dimensional model, you can do almost as well as with the large eddy simulation here. It works in other cases too. Here's a shallow convection in the tropics, a cumulus cloud. It's also pretty well captured. It's a funny spike at the top that um, we by now know how the data rises and how to make this better. Uh, deep convection over the Amazon, here's another case. 
this is perhaps interesting, it shows the updraft velocity in a large edge simulation and in the one dimensional model. And the key thing to see here is that the onset of deep convection, the timing of the onset of deep convection is captured very well by this parameterization. Um, so it captures the general cycle of deep convection well. It has been a problem for parameterization for a long time. We think it captures it well because it has this continuous transition from continuous to deep convection without discontinuous switches between parameterizations and the like. It's all one unified scheme that captures all these regimes. As I said, this is just with educated guesses for entrainment, detrainment. Um, a few people in the group have started to estimate these functions more precisely. You get even further improvements on the fit, but this fit is already quite good. So this new scheme it can be used in a gray zone where convection is partially resolved because it has the memory terms, it has, a, it has the right limits. It captures dynamical regimes from boundary layer turbulence to deep convection. And it, it does so with just what I showed you just has order a dozen or order 10 adjustable parameters or so. It's relatively few parameters relative to the many parameters you have on traditional schemes and very, very few relative to um, deep learning approaches. So what we're currently doing is implementing this in the climate model that we're building and we're we're in the process of calibrating it with many large eddy simulations. We've done it with dozens. We're now having about 100 and going towards 1,000 large eddy simulations driven by a climate model, which we want to use to calibrate the scheme um, to data, in this case, computation generated data for now more precisely. So this calibration part, I wanted to talk for a few minutes about how that works. Um, calibrate schemes like what I showed you and quantifying uncertainties is an important other part of that. You want to have uncertainties quantified to have predictions that become usable in practice. You don't always just want the point prediction, say what's the mean sea level rise. You want to have uh, tail risks on either end estimated, so quantifying uncertainties becomes important. And let me show you how we are doing this. So this is joint work with Andrew Stewart, my colleague at Caltech, and Oli Dunbar, Alfredo Garbuno, and uh, Emmett Clary also contributed to this. So what we want to do is improve climate models in a similar way that weather forecasts have improved through ultimately data simulation approaches. But our target here are climate statistics accumulated in time. So, for example, over the season, the seasonal cycle is a great strong signal in the climate system we want to explode, exploit to cal calibrate a model with. We do it with climate statistics, meaning you can minimize mismatches between means, that means uh, minimize mismatches and minimize model biases, for example, on top of the atmosphere radiative uh, fluxes or mean precipitation and the like. But you can do it for any statistics of a climate system. You can also minimize mismatches in covariances, emergent constraints, covariances between surface temperature and cloud cover over the seasonal cycle or year to year, to year variability, or any extreme climate statistic you're interested in, extreme precipitation and the like. All these things can, be, can become part of an objective function that you minimize. So that's one advantage of using climate statistics rather than say weather states. Um, for data simulation. It focuses on what you want to predict in a climate setting. It also results in a smoother objective function because statistics vary more smoothly than states. So mean cloud cover is a smoothly varying function in space and time, even though if instantaneous cloud cover is not. It focuses on relevant statistics, as I mentioned, cloud covariances between cloud cover and temperature, which are emerging constraints, you can directly include them in the objective function, meaning you can directly include them in the in the calibration process of a model rather than just as a diagnostic tool after the fact. The downside is that evaluating the objective function means running a climate model that's extremely expensive. So traditional methods for learning from data for Bayesian, for example, are prohibitively expensive in this in this setting. Our setting is that we have um, a climate model G that takes some parameters, the parameter vectors, say parameters on convection scheme or whatever else it might be, and maps them to observe climate statistics Y here. And there's a central limit theorem applying, we just average in time. So there's some noise that can be plausibly taken as Gaussian um, that you need to add to the mapping from parameters um, to the model statistics if you want to compare it with observed statistics. Both calibration and uncertain quantification are important to us. GE as a climate model is extremely expensive to evaluate. 
we only have approximations of G. It's not a perfect model in the end. And often, or typically, we do not have derivatives of the model. This was, these were our constraints that we set ourselves. And the question is, how do we do this? How do we calibrate parameters and estimate uncertainties in them? And the algorithm we came up with was <clears throat> a marriage of tools for data simulation that have been used in weather forecasting for decades and tools for machine learning. And the algorithm we came up with, we called Calibrate Emulate Sample because that describes what it is. So it has a first step, which is a calibration step that uses variants of ensemble common smoothing, ensemble common inversion um, to estimate the parameter vector theta given data y. These ensemble methods are, they converge rapidly. You, they scale well to high dimensional parameter spaces. You need ensembles typically of size 100 and typically they converge within a few iterations, five or so, even in cases where the parameter vector is high dimensional as it is, for example, in weather forecasting, if uh, the parameter space can be, can be ten to, of dimension 10 to the nine. The problem is that the ensemble does not give you good uncertainty estimates, which we also wanted. It gives a good point estimate of what the best parameter is, but not good uncertainty estimate. And that's known, you can prove it in a linear case that it, the uncertainty ensemble spread is not a good measure of uncertainty. Um, so what we did then to get uncertainty out of this and certainly quantification out of it is you have a ensemble common inversion, you have an ensemble size 100, you run five iterations, then you have 500 evaluations of the climate model. That gives us an opportunity to train an emulator, for example, show you examples from Gaussian processes or neural networks during the calibration stage. And that emulator becomes very cheap to evaluate. And then we can sample from the emulator with standard methods like Markov chain Monte Carlo. We can evaluate the emulator a million times at not much cost compared to the calibration step and thereby get good uncertainty estimation. In a way, what the ensemble common version does for us is solve the experimental design problem of where to place, um, where to place training points to get a good emulator of the subjective function of, of the climate model. And then we can sample from the emulator. You can also incorporate experimental design approaches into this pipeline, answering the question of where to place the next high resolution simulation. And Oli Dunbar is working on it. We'll talk about that part right now. What comes out in the end is an approximate Bayesian posterior estimate. That means quantified uncertainties, including covariance structure of error and the like at a fraction of the cost of what typical approaches take. So this MCMC typically it's, it requires 10 to the five or 10 to the six model evaluations. And we have these 10 to the five or 10 to the six evaluations of the emulator, which is cheap, but we get the emulator with order 10 to the two or 10 to the three um, evaluations of a model in the calibration step. So the net result is a good factor thousand speed up over traditional um, algorithms, which makes the whole approach feasible for climate models. Um, let me just illustrate quickly how this works in one simple example. This is from an idealized climate model that has a very simple convection scheme that just relaxes temperatures towards the moist adiabat, moisture towards um, a fixed relative humidity in convective regions on some time scale tau. And there is this relative humidity parameter RH ref here that appears as well. So it's a, it's a Betz Miller type convection scheme. There are two critical parameters time scale tau, relative humidity. Our age. And what we are doing is use an objective function that contains the relative humidity, the mean precipitation rate, and a measure of precipitation extremes. We minimize that in this ensemble common inversion step here. And this will be in, in animation. So we start with 100 points in this two dimensional parameter space of relative humidity and time scale. This is a perfect model experiment. We know the true values two hours and 70% at the cross of the red dashed lines. And you see if this ensemble runs in five steps or so, the ensemble collapses approximately to the correct parameter estimate, which is great. So it gives you good, good calibration. However, the ensemble collapses and does not provide useful information about uncertainty anymore at that point. Um, but here we have order 500 evaluations of this relatively simple climate model it gives us good calibration. We can train an emulator on these 500 evaluations. And here is the emulator on our objective function, which as I said, has the mean relative humidity in the metro troposphere, the mean precipitation rate, and 
as a measure of extreme events, we just took the exceedance over a threshold. And the threshold in this case was just the 90th percentile of precipitation at any given latitude. It's not a very extreme extreme. And in blue is what the GCM does. And orange is what, in this case, the Gaussian process emulator um, gives us. And the point is that the emulator captures the model output very well. The, the, the bars and whiskers give 95% um, confidence intervals from the GCM and the same 95% confidence intervals from the Gaussian process are showed in shading. So this gives us good emulation um, for, and has additional advantages, for example, in providing a smoother objective function, which is important in chaotic systems like the climate system. You could replace Gaussian processes here with neural networks. They would scale better. Um, we're in the process of trying that out. So then we can take this emulator and sample from it many times, in this case, 500,000 times. And here is the posterior density that we get out of it. So here's this time scale tau, true values at two hours, the relative humidity here, true values at 70%. So here's the true value. For comparison, dots show the common ensemble as it is collapsed. And these are now contours level sets of the posterior density. And you see the posterior density spans a broader range than the ensemble. So the ensemble is not giving a good estimate of the uncertainty. And actually, maximum of the posterior is nice, pretty close to the true value. And we can, in this case, the model is simple enough. We can brute force compute the uncertainties by just brute force sampling in this parameter space. And this is what's shown on the right here, your standard deviations from this gold standard, if you want to call it that and from the Calibrate Amulet sample algorithm, and they're quite similar. Whereas the standard deviation of the ensemble is a good order of magnitude smaller. So we get approximate Bayesian inversion at roughly a thousandth of the cost of standard methods, and it's, um, it makes it feasible to use for climate models. What you get out of it is a posterior density on parameters and sample from that posterior density, and then make predictions of a change climate, for example, that's just a proof of concept showing a change in uh, precipitation extreme. This is the probability of exceeding the 99.9th percentile of the controlled precipitation in a climate that now is warmer. And the um, blue here is, is a simulation with this idealized climate model that um, shows the probability of exceeding this percentile of the controlled precipitation. And you see what, what we know happens in a warming climate, you, the probability of exceeding the, the uh, extreme precipitation increases. I mean, it, it should be in the reference, at 3%, what used to be a 0.1% event in the polls here. And more to the point that um, we get good uncertainty estimates out of it, shown by the um, shading here that shows the the it shows a 95% confidence interval for extreme statistics. Once we sample the posterior density um, that we have calculated in this calibrated emulate sample algorithm, the shading around the blue line just shows an internal variability. So here, the problem is chosen such that the parametric uncertainty becomes relatively large relative to the internal variability that you see the effect. What's missing here is quantifying systematic model errors. It's something else we have been working on ways of quantifying structural model error, you can incorporate structural model error terms in, in this framework as well. We have some results and uh, preprints submitted on how to do that. So we happy to talk with people about it offline. So the same approach we are pursuing for all components of the newer system model. I focused on through the clouds collection part because that's mostly what's going on in my group. There are others working with similar approaches on the land. Uh, the MIT group is working on the ocean and the like. What we want is a model that learns automatically from observations and high resolution simulations spun out on the fly. The high resolution simulations give you more detailed information where the observations alone are not sufficient. And they give you data, computation generated climate, data in changed climate. So they give you a guard against overfitting. What we want is at least a factor to reduction in RMS errors of key statistics like rainfall extremes or energy fluxes at the top of the atmosphere. And the hope is that in the end, this whole system will anchor an ecosystem of downstream apps, for example, for infrastructure planning, projections of wildfire, flood risk, and the like. It's still early days for us, we're two years in, we have cores of the model, we have cores of algorithms that I showed you, but we're a good bit away from um, anything, anything that can be, can be operationalized. So to conclude, the I think it's within reach 
to reduce and quantify uncertainties in climate models. And I, I hope I have shown you and convinced you with just a few case studies how to do it. And what we do, and I think what the recipe for success here ought to be is combine process informed models like the cloud turbulence convection model I showed you with data driven approaches that are based on climate statistics and time aggregated statistics. That, that point is important because Again, it smooths the objective functions. It focuses on what matters for predicting climate, and it's available. We have good climate statistics. Uh, say, if you use deep learning to replace a convection scheme altogether, as some have tried, you're, these are very data hungry methods. You are forced to confine yourself to using computationally generated data tendencies, for example. Um, they may be too data hungry to exploit the data we actually have. We wanted to use the data we actually have. And that, I think, essentially forces you to use process informed models as far as you can. The very satisfying aspect of doing this work for all of us, I think, was that just being rigorous about the physics and mathematics and subgrid scale models like the turbulence and convection scheme, it can get you quite far. It can capture turbulence cloud regimes that are quite disparate and have X climate models for decades from stable boundary layers to stratocumulus top boundary layers to deep convection. And this Calibrate Emulate Sample Pipeline forms the core of how we do data assimilation machine learning. And it, it achieves up to a thousand fold speed up relative to traditional Bayesian learning methods like Markov chain Monte Carlo, which makes it feasible um, to use with a climate model. A good thousand evaluations of a climate model are feasible. A million are not. Um, a lot of work still remains to be done, more development of subgrid scale models on the data simulation machine learning side. We are still working on more effective filtering strategies, um, the question of how to optimally target high resolution simulations, and so forth and so forth. It's a, it's a very rich for a lot of good projects, um, students, postdocs, early career scientists um, to make a difference here. Our funding comes primarily from Eric and Wendy Schmidt by recommendation of Schmidt Futures and um, Mountain Philanthropies is another major funder. The National Science Foundation is providing support through a CSSI grant, and there's a few other um, funders, Charlie Trimble, Ronald McZean Lind, and the Paul G. Allen Family Foundation, who helped us get started with that. I'll uh, stop right here. I'm happy to answer questions people have. Thank you, Dr. Schneider. Um, if anyone has any questions, they can raise their virtual hand. Uh, the button should be above the chat when you expand the attendee panel. Oh, there's, a, there's one already from Safa Mout. Um, Safa, you are unmuted. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Schneider. This was a very impressive, uh, very informative uh, presentation. And uh, these are really path-breaking advances that you have shown are really mind-blowing. Um, so, in the last in the slide before your conclusion slide, if you can go back where you showed the Earth system. Yep. So, yeah. So, so, so all the work, all this amazing work that you guys are uh, that that you guys are doing and have done, really focuses on the subsystems of the natural subsystems of the Earth system. And these are really important if you're focused on the weather predictions or uh, short term climate predictions within, you know, within a year or two. But once we uh, go to time scales of a decade or more, what becomes really important, what becomes the real driver of all these changes in different subsystems of this, uh, of this whole Earth system, not just the climate, but all the other components of the environmental systems like the land and and uh, ocean and uh, water, fresh water, and so on and so forth, is the human system, is really um, the human environmental pressures that really determine what will happen to all those subsystems. So my question is that, uh, are you planning at some point of time with your collaborators at the Climate Modeling Alliance to incorporate some of those um, human systems and couple them with bidirectional feedbacks to these Earth system components? 
Maybe eventually. So the, I mean, the, the uncertainty that, so the human systems for us are boundary conditions, right? So we take, say, emission scenarios as given and then convert them into climate change scenarios. Um, I think what you're saying is, well, in the end, the scenario uncertainty of the emissions you have or what other impacts humans have on the land and the like becomes large. And that's true, but only over time scales of more than 50 years or so. It's not, not 10 years already. Um, the problem is that how to predict what humans will do on decadal time scales is obviously really hard. I, I think using a system like what we are outlining here for what if scenarios said, so if humans do that, this is what happens. Playing that out, obviously, we can do this is what it's designed to do. Um, but try to actually predict what humans will do. I, I'm hesitant to try to do it simply because in the past attempts of doing so have not been all that successful. And we just don't know the equations governing human behavior and have little, little, um, Little, little to go from to put it in a model. Uh, say, how do you model massive migration, uh, wars, and the like? I, our goal is to focus on the on the sort of things we can model with the tools of science, the physical, biological, chemical subsystems, and build a system that allows you to play out what if scenarios. If if humans do this, this is what happens to climate, and then what might this imply for further human actions? trying to have a full integrated system that also tries to predict humans, not for us anytime soon. Yeah, but uh, so the only thing is that these, uh, these human behavior or the human actions and decisions, they could be also dynamically modeled and coupled with feedbacks to parts of the system. And I mean, I, I think I disagree with the fact that it's only important in a 50 year or a hundred year. I think you know, based on the studies we have done, it really shows the effect once you go to a decadal uh, time scale, actually the uncertainty that comes in from the human actions and decisions becomes more important and bigger than the uncertainty that we see uh, playing out on the climate system. But I mean, I wouldn't, you know, I would maybe uh, get in touch with you separately via email and uh, send, you know, send some of our uh, papers and that I think it's in the attendance also uh, Professor Shukla who's also one of our collaborators on those projects and uh, Dr. Yuhang Nakalne so I will send you um, maybe continue the conversation at email but thank you very much uh, very okay. impressive thank you yeah I mean just to be clear in some regions obviously human where I'm sitting in LA just think about the last hundred years right I mean the dominant change in my local environment my neighborhood here is just human construction and the like, right? I, I don't disagree with that part. It's just, when you think about larger scales, that scenario uncertainties and the like take a bit. The way I think we want to interact with humans is by this last bullet point on this slide, that having some ecosystem of apps. What I want is for everyone to have climate information in their hands, just, just the same way they have a weather forecast in their hands on, on the smartphone, that whenever you have to make a decision that might have some your climate risks might have some impact, you know, purchasing, pro purchasing property, investing, whatever it might be, that you can easily assess climate risks for your decision. And then, of course, that can have an Im impact on how humans use that information and, and make those decisions. And I think that to us is the principal way of interacting with the human component here. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is from Lauren Zamora. Lauren, you're unmuted. Hi. Um, so I was just wondering, uh, so I don't know much about your, um, about this, you know, about using data simulation or AI in models, although what you're standing, what you're doing sounds really great and exciting. So that's cool. But I, I'm wondering about some of the nuances of it. Um, for example, when you have gaps in the data from different instruments or when there's data drift in a given instrument, um, how does, how does what you do protect from any spurious predictions that might come from some of the processes that that um, you, you know that the AI, AI does. Yeah, I mean, again, as, as there's the first this answer is nothing here um, absolves you from quality control on data, right? I mean, that's the same issue in weather prediction. That's a really important step that you 
know the characteristics of the data, you know the error characteristics of the data, and you know any systematic problems the data might have. And that's that's the same here. Um, missing data are less of a problem with our approach, just because again you aggregate in time. So if you're missing some data in the aggregate, that's not necessarily a big problem. Um, and I think part of your question though is how do you guard against overfitting against the to the observations you have right now? And I think that's really important. And again, a good part of that is using these process and models as far as we can go. That leads to sparse parameterizations, relatively few, param few parameters we estimate, and um, try to prevent overfitting to the data we have right now that way. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Our next question is from Suman Sneegam. Um, Suman, you're unmuted. Uh, hi, Tapiel. I enjoyed the talk. And in the first part, you tried to link climate sensitivity to the absence or presence of uh, mm -hmm. these uh, shallow clouds, the stratocumulus decks, and you focus more on the short wave effects. But isn't there some compensation between the short wave and the long wave that should mute the sensitivity to some extent? Well, that's not for the low clouds because they're so low, their greenhouse effect is relatively weak, so it, it's their main effect is short wave. Once you're for the deep clouds, yes, you have large compensation and that becomes a, a question then how to how that compensation goes so once you're uh for deep convective clouds you're absolutely right. i mean you you have to worry about the long wave part it becomes very essential for the shallow clouds it's it's some modification of the short wave effect but it's it's a relatively minor modification just because we're so low that the temperature at the cloud top is pretty close to the um surface temperature but these cloud tops are around two or three kilometers, is it not? I mean, the stratocumulus? Stratocumulus are generally lower. It's about a kilometer hmm. or higher. Okay, thank you. Thanks. So. Our next question is from Timothy Del Sol. Timothy, you're unmuted. Hi, Tapio. Uh, good to see you. This is an impressive work and a really nice presentation. Uh, I had a question about the ensemble collapse. Do you think it might be possible to fix the common filter, maybe with covariance inflation or localization? Wouldn't that be yeah. more um, satisfying than emulators and Markov Mar chain Mark Monte Carlo, which might be there just to fix the collapse? It's, so we have, I didn't talk about it. We've actually done such things. You can, um, there's a paper that introduces we call the ensemble camel sampler, which is basically a way of preventing the collapse of the ensemble um, in, in a rigorous way that gives you the spread, if you wish. The problem remains, though, that if you're in high dimensional parameter spaces, you have an ensemble of size 100 or something. If you would look at error statistics straight from the ensemble, they, they remain quite limiting. It's still advantageous to use in that case too. So what this ensemble common sampler does for you in a way is provide really good training points for the emulator that solves the the, the problems you usually have in error estimation in the high dimensional spaces you know, that um, the other people have used say history matching and the like to achieve a similar effect. You just need to reduce your high dimensional parameter space to, to some manageable manifold and we can actually estimate errors. And what this ensemble common sampler does is, is precisely that. And it's still good to emulate and sample from the emulator because it gives you some smoothing that's, um, but it smooth statistics and gives you more higher order information and put it that way. Okay. Yeah, you could use the ensemble for some error estimation in that case. That's all interesting. I, I have I'm not aware of this sampler, so this is good. Thanks. It's a paper by Andrew Stewart, Frank Hoffman, and a few others. Um, it has a more complicated title than what I said. It's something about gradient flows. Very good. Yeah. We also have a text question from Roxy Jiang. So she says. In slide 33, oh, you can see it. Oh, I'll read it. I'll read it for everybody anyway. In slide 33, 
In slide 33, we talk about using higher order statistics in objective function. However, when using higher order statistics in objective functions fails to identify parameters uniquely, how should we address it? Yeah, I mean, in general, we all post inverse problems. So the, the, the best parameter set is not uniquely determined by any set of data we specify. So the usual way of dealing with that is having prior information. And um, so we have prior ranges or prior distributions for, for the parameters based on what we know about what's physically plausible, what we have learned in the development process of these models. And you have to use that prior information to um, to identify parameters. It, it's not restricted to higher order statistics. I mean, higher order statistics actually help alleviate that problem because they give you more data, more information from which you can um, estimate parameters. But it's it's a generic problem and it's not a problem that entirely goes away with priors. So there may still be, for example, if you have correlated parameters, uh, there may still be a situation that, that you, know, you can increase one parameter by factor two. And if you also increase another parameter by factor two or decrease by factor two, you get just as good a fit. Um, so then you still have non-uniqueness. The good news is that's the non-uniqueness you see, especially in the posterior error statistics that you have. So you would see a valley in the posterior density rather than a, a unique minimizer. And then you can use that to go back and ask, well, why are these parameters correlated? Maybe I can reparameterize my model to re remove one of the parameters or several of them and the like. But that's, um, that's where the human in the loop here becomes crucial. And I should say, in general, the choice of objective function is, of course, not objective, right? I mean, that's a human choice. That's a choice we make based on what we care about and what our experience is, what provides good information about the parameters we're interested in. Thank you. So another verbal question from Steve Guimond. Steve, you're unmuted. Uh, yeah, I had a question about the uh, overfitting. It seems like it is a could be a major problem. Have you guys done, since we have a fairly long record now of satellite data, have you done any data denial experiments where, say, you only use the early part of the record and, and yeah. predict the, you know, and, and how does that perform in that case? We want to do it. We haven't done it yet. We're not there yet. So we have a good bit of development to do before we want to do such things. But yes, that's precisely what, I mean, the, the, the first thing I would like to try to do is, say, use the last 20 years of data focusing on seasonal cycle, perhaps some interannual variability to calibrate a model. And then see if you can do the 20th century without uh, having fitted to it, right? That's sort of the first obvious thing to try. And we'll see how it works. I don't know yet. Okay, thank you. Another text question um, from Jagadish Shukla. Any plans to validate the model by estimating its predictability for real events? Uh, what was the beginning? Estimate predictability from re real events? What was the first part? Any plans to validate the model by estimating its predictability oh, for yeah. real events? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Shukla. I would love to, right? I mean, there's sort of the obvious things we like to do is do ENSO prediction and see if you how well you do interannual variability. Um, yes, I think I think those things are crucial to do, right? It's the, the hard part about climate is that whether you test every day in climate, you know, you need to wait for a while before you uh, have a true test of the model and you like to have some confidence that a model is good before having waited for a while. So as much as you can do um, using real events, using volcanic eruptions and so all the things that are happening in the climate system as as tests for the model, you should do and we will. Great, thank you. Um, that's all the questions that I have now. We can wait another minute for any last minute questions. Well, it's great to hear from you, especially some of you I haven't talked with in a while, and I hope one day we can all, all see each other again. It'd be yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Schneider, for such a great talk. Yeah. Um, seems like it went really well. And to everybody yeah. else, our seminar series continues next week. Thanks, everyone, for coming.